The League of Women Voters US is promoting a national effort to produce people-powered FAIR maps. This program, Working Toward FAIR Maps, Redistricting 101, is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Idaho and will be presented by three League members today. I am Kathy Dawes, a retired science teacher who's been a member of League of Women Voters of Moscow since 2017 and was actively involved in the census and currently serve on the advocacy and speaker series committees for the Moscow League. Linda Engel, a member of League of Women Voters of Pocatello since 2016, has organized events and given presentations for the League. She is currently faculty in the Idaho State University Math Department and teaches about the math behind fair districting. And Pam Ward has been a member of the League of Women Voters of Pocatello since 1995 and serves on the board of directors of League of Women Voters of Idaho. And with that introduction, I will now turn the program over to Pam. Thank you. Leagues around the nation collaborate to study public policy and come to consensus on selected issues. <clears throat> In 1966, the League of Women Voters adopted a position that both houses of state legislatures must be apportioned substantially on population and extended this to all voting districts in 1972. The current position is stated on this slide. The People Powered Fair Maps campaign focuses on creating fair political maps in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Depending on the state, forms of advocacy may include ballot initiatives like constitutional amendments and amicus briefs in lawsuits. In Idaho, our focus is on civic education and public participation. In 2021, Idaho will use the U.S. Census data to change the boundaries of political districts. This happens every 10 years, and changing boundaries can produce changes in your representation. However, there will be opportunities for you to give input on the new boundaries. Our objective with this presentation is to make Idahoans aware of how boundary choices can determine legislation that affects our lives. We bring this to you because the League's mission is to increase informed participation in public policy decisions. Today, we'll share information about the basics of how redistricting happens, what is meant by gerrymandering and how it affects fairness, the League's position on redistricting criteria, how Idaho conducts the redistricting process, and how you can get involved and make your voice heard. First, the basics. Redistricting follows the 10-year census. It is a redrawing of district boundaries due to changes in population, which impacts the number of representatives at the state and national level. Redistricting is needed because population changes in 10 years and districts must be equalized. Since 1988, League has encouraged full participation in the census and ensured that redistricting complied with the one person, one vote requirements under the Voting Right Acts. Well, how can we know if boundaries are drawn fairly? To begin, we need to understand gerrymandering. What is gerrymandering? It's the manipulation of district boundaries to disadvantage a political party racial minority or ethnic group. Gerrymandering in the United States was used as early as 1788 to increase the power of a political party. The term was coined in 1812 
when Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry drew redistricting maps. When the maps were reviewed, one of the districts resembled a salamander. And over time, the word gerrymander came to be pronounced with a soft G as in Jerry, the pronunciation we use today. Next, we're going to show a short video that will explain this concept clearly. While this video is focused on gerrymandering by one political party, we want to remind viewers that League does not support or oppose any candidate or any particular party. In 2018, Americans voted for who would represent them in Congress. But in North Carolina, the election results were really weird. These squares represent all the voters in North Carolina. They were voting for these 13 seats in Congress. About half voted for Republicans, and about 48% voted for Democrats. So you might think of the 13 congressional seats, maybe Democrats would have won six seats, and Republicans would have won seven. But no, Democrats only won three of 13 seats, way less than half. This imbalance was because North Carolina's congressional districts had been gerrymandered. It means that these voters had been grouped into districts very strategically with the goal of benefiting one party. Gerrymandering has pretty much always happened in America. That's because every 10 years, the political districts are redrawn. And in most cases, those new lines get drawn by whoever holds power in state government at the time. That's what happened in 2010. Republicans won control of lots of state governments and redrew the political lines to favor themselves. And over the next few years, redistricting helped them hold on to almost all those states. This shifted the balance of power. And it turns out behind a lot of this was one guy. Usually the voters get to pick the politicians. In redistricting, the politicians get to pick the voters. This is Thomas Hoffler the map maker who helped Republicans gerrymander districts over the last decade. When Hoffler died in 2018, his daughter found thousands of his emails and files, which she shared with activists. The files show that Tom Hoffler's fingerprints are all over the way America's political maps look today. But North Carolina was his masterpiece. And if you want to understand why gerrymandering is such a big problem in the US, that's a good place to start. The basics of gerrymandering are actually pretty simple. If you're a Republican trying to keep power, you want to do two things. First, pack as many Democratic voters as possible into a single district. If you have a district where almost everyone votes Democrat, that means almost half these votes are basically wasted. You can also crack big Democratic areas into separate districts where there are slightly more Republicans. So even though an area has a lot of Democratic votes, they would actually lose in this district and in this district. These are the two elements of classic gerrymandering, packing and cracking. And Hoffler employed these techniques masterfully in North Carolina. In 2011, he was hired to redraw the state's political lines. And for congressional districts, he came up with this map. Now I just want to focus in on District 12, this weird skinny shape. In order to make sense of this shape, we have to look at another map. This map shows the percentage of black people in each neighborhood. The bluer areas are where more black people live. Hoffler basically gathered up black people in Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and Charlotte, and packed them into one district. So that's how District 12 happened. Hoffler also did this with North Carolina state representatives and state senators. For example, here are the state senate districts. Here, he packed Winston-Salem into one district and then packed Greensboro into its own district. These new districts helped Republicans get a stranglehold on power in the North Carolina State House. And over the next few years, they were able to pass crucial legislation. A strict new voter ID law in North Carolina. Which bathrooms transgender individuals can use in North Carolina? In 2016 and 2017, federal courts ruled that both of these maps were unconstitutional. They said what North Carolina Republicans did wasn't just gerrymandering, it was racial gerrymandering done to deliberately dilute the political power of black people. 
The court said the Republicans in the North Carolina State House now had to redraw the lines without looking at racial demographics. So, they went back to Tom Hoffler. This time, Hoffler couldn't look at race. Instead, he looked at which areas voted for Democrats and which areas voted for Republicans. Instead of a racial gerrymander, it would be a partisan gerrymander. Here's that map, using data from 2014. The bluer an area, the more Democratic voters there are. Now, if you zoom in here to Greensboro, you can see one of the highest concentrations of Democratic voters in the state. Hoffler drew a congressional district line to crack this community in half. This meant Democrats here were now in the minority in their district, and Democrats here were also in the minority in their district. Hoffler employed these techniques all over the state to create North Carolina's new political districts. And the first big test for these new maps would be the 2018 election. Democrats were expected to turn out in droves. Democrats are vying for a potential blue wave. The wave that Republicans fear is going to wipe them out. So, how do the maps do? For state representatives, Democrats got 51% of the vote. They only won 46% of seats. For state Senate, they received half the vote and won just 42% of seats. And for Congress, you already know how that one turned out. Democrats won nearly half the votes, but won only three out of 13 seats. A year later in 2019, the Supreme Court weighed in. They said it was beyond their reach that it wasn't their job to fix it. All of this raised an existential question. If Republicans could continue drawing the lines to stay in power, how could they ever be elected out of office? But the Supreme Court's ruling left open the possibility for state courts to rule on partisan gerrymandering. And in September 2019, that's exactly what North Carolina's Supreme Court did. The court found that partisan gerrymandering violated the state constitution. In the court's decision, it was Hoffler's files that helped prove that North Carolina Republicans drew these lines with the clear intention of benefiting themselves. Ultimately, the court said North Carolina Republicans had to redraw the state House and state Senate maps one more time. This new map, approved by North Carolina legislators, is much less biased toward one party, even though it took some extreme measures and nearly a decade to force politicians to draw a fair map. In the last few years, the courts in several states, like Florida and Pennsylvania, have made partisan gerrymandering much harder. And now that's also the case in North Carolina. Hoffler is gone now. But in other states across the country, many maps he helped draw are still in use. And while there's now a clearer strategy to challenge those maps in state courts, many voters are still effectively not choosing their representatives. It's like Hoffler said, the representatives are choosing the voters. Of course, redistricting is democracy at work. Redistricting is like an election in reverse. It's a great event. In the video, we saw examples of cracking and packing in North Carolina to disadvantage a racial minority and then a political party. As we will see, both Democrats and Republicans do this. The video highlighted North Carolina. In 2016, Democratic candidates had 48% of the vote, but won only 23% of the seats in Congress. That same year in Maryland, Republican candidates received 35% of the vote but won only 12.5% of the seats in Congress. These are examples showing that both parties use gerrymandering to disadvantage the party not in power. Now, Linda will discuss how gerrymandering and fairness can be measured. We will see three examples of how to measure gerrymandering. The first way is using partisan bias, which we saw in the video. Here we have the lovely state of boring rectangle. O's represent one party and X's represent another. This map shows the whole state and we can see where voter li voters live in the state. Total number of voters is 30. There are 18 O voters. 18 over 30 gives us 60%. 
There are 12 X voters in our state. 12 over 30 is 40 percent. What we want to achieve with redistricting is this same proportion in the legislature. To help us remember, we will put this box of goals over here. Our ideal set of districts will have 60% O and 40% X representation in the legislature. In fact, this proportion of O's to X's is very similar to what we find in Idaho. We'll discuss that in a minute. There are five districts in Boring Rectangle. Each district has one representative. Since there are five districts, there are five seats. So of course, the more seats you have, the more power you have. Here is example number one. With this dis drawing of boundaries, O wins three rows out of five, so 60%, and X wins two rows out of five, so 40%. O gets three seats and X gets two seats. Are citizens fairly represented? Check if the percentage of seats match the state percentages in the goal box. Yes, because the percentages of O and X representation mirrors the population as a whole, as shown in our red goal box. So here we have district redistricting example number two. Ask yourself, who wins which districts? So O wins four out of five seats, that's 80%. We can see that X wins just one seat out of five for 20%. Are citizens fairly represented? No, but this example of partisan bias might go unnoticed because O does have a majority. This scenario has parallels in our state. It's interesting to pause here for a moment to observe the similarities between our fictitious boring rectangle and Idaho. As in the video, we represented all Idaho voters by 100 squares on the top. Below, we see our senators and representatives totaling 105 legislators. In last year's presidential election, Idaho voters voted like this, with 33% Democrat and 64% Republican. These percentages have remained about the same since 2012. So, one might think that the Idaho legislature would reflect this. That percentage would break out would look like this. But that's not what we find today. We find Democrats are represented by only 19 seats, or 18%, and Republicans have 86 seats, or 82%. One important consideration is that in the last election, 48 out of the 105 legislative races had no opposition to the Republican candidates. Let's go back to our fictitious state of boring rectangle and look at redistricting scenario number three. The efficiency gap is our next measure of gerrymandering. The votes that don't make any difference to the outcome of the election are called wasted votes. The imbalance between wasted votes on one side compared to the other is the efficiency gap. The party with more wasted votes end up, ends up with less governing power. So ask yourself again, who wins which districts? This time, Two out of five seats were won by the party of O's, that's 40%. And three out of five were won by the X party, that's 60%. Are citizens fairly represented? We can see that this is not fair. X's are only 40% of the population, but now they have 60% representation in the government. How did X's manage to flip the power and take over the House of Representatives? The minority party X drew district lines so they have more power, and here's how they did it. O voters here were cracked. Notice that six O votes were wasted because there were far too few of them in each district to matter. And half of these votes, in each of these two districts, another six were wasted because they were packed. 
Packing is when there are too many voters of one party stuffed into a district. Between packing and cracking, O's have a total of 12 wasted votes. What about the X voters? Notice there are six voters in every district, and half would be three voters. And there, are, there is one X voter over half in each of the green districts. Therefore, three X voters are wasted. The efficiency gap is calculated by subtracting the wasted votes on one side from those on the other and dividing by the population. Anything under about 8% is considered okay due to normal clustering. We find here it's 30%, well over 8%, so this boundary map is very gerrymandered. Let's now look at how the efficiency gap has shifted in the United States from 1970 to 2012. Both Republicans and Democrats gerrymander fe federal congressional districts. The following graphs are from a paper published by the University of Chicago Law Review. Let's start with the 1970s and discuss the meaning of this graph. So each point is a state abbreviation. All districts within each state were analyzed. The solid bar in the middle means the efficiency gap is at zero, so for those states, they have an equal number of wasted Democrat and Republican votes. The shaded area is the proposed 8% that accounts for our natural tendency to group together, for example, Chinatown. We have circled Idaho in red. Notice where it is on the chart. By 2012, nine other states have also moved outside the desired range. In the 1970s, most of the districts fell within the proposed range, indicating an acceptable distribution of power. According to this efficiency gap analysis, by 2012, many states are no longer within that range. Let's look at our last way to measure gerrymandering. Compactness measures the degree of gerrymandering using the shape of the district. A circle is the most compact shape possible and has a compactness score of 1, which is the most fair shape. Gerrymandering is more extreme when the compactness value is closer to 0. The C in our equation means compactness. Let's measure the compactness of a square district. So follow the cursor as I count. So we're looking for the area, so we're going to count how many squares there are. One, two, three, four, and five. And there are five rows of five, and that, so that's 25, an area of 25. And now I'll count the perimeter. One, two, three, four, five. And we have five coming down here, five across here, and five back up there for a total of 20. So with an area of 25 and a perimeter of 20, we see the compactness for our square is 0.79. That's pretty good. A square district is not badly gerrymandered. Now let's take a district shape from our previous example. Remember, the smaller the number, the stronger the gerrymandering. So let's count again. We have area, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have six squares for the area and for the perimeter. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So with an area of 6 and a perimeter of 14, we can see that this shape has a compactness score of 0.34 and proves to be quite gerrymandered. Next, we'll discuss the compactness of Idaho districts. Let's look at Idaho's districts using compactness values that were calculated by Dave's redistricting maps. Remember, the lower the number, the less compact. So Idaho's 35 districts have an average compactness of 0.4 as marked by the X on the number line. Let's start with District 5, which has the best score of all Idaho districts with 0.71. Let's see how 
Let's, uh, we can see it looks very much like our previous square and has a similar compactness score. 10 of Idaho's current districts have a compactness score of 0.3 or lower. We'll look at five of them. Watch the shapes of the districts and their compactness scores. The circle on the map shows the location of each district. We'll start with District 11, which has a compactness of 0.2. District 32 has a score of 0.22. District 34 has a compactness of 0.25. Here's District 4, and we end with District 26 near Twin Falls. 10 of Idaho's 35 districts, almost one-third have extremely low compactness scores. Before we discuss some tools, you can use to draw your own Idaho district boundaries. Pam will talk about league's criteria for what makes a good district. Although Lee and the U.S. Supreme Court prioritize equal population for fair representation, redistricting must be judged on these additional requirements. Geographic contiguity, partisan fairness, preservation of communities of interest, respect for municipal and county boundaries, compactness, and must reject protection of incumbents through such devices as considering an incumbent's address and preferential treatment for political party affiliation, voting history, and candidate residence redistricting at all levels of government must be accomplished in an open unbiased manner with citizen access at all levels and steps of the process there should be specific timely timelines full disclosure through the process public hearings with citizen participation and shall follow all open meeting laws now, Kathy will discuss how redistricting happens in Idaho. Idaho is divided into two congressional districts, giving us our two representatives in Congress and 35 legislative districts, each with one senator and two representatives serving in the state legislature. That's why we have 105 total, as mentioned earlier. How is the commission that draws the district boundary lines determined? The Idaho League was instrumental in the adoption of the Idaho statute procedures for selecting our bipartisan reapportionment commissioners. To assure bipartisanship, members are appointed by the two Senate leaders, the two House leaders, and party chairs. In addition, members cannot be an elected or appointed Idaho official and may not serve in the legislature for five years after serving on the commission. A majority of four of the six members must agree on the final boundary line drawing. Idaho is one of only a few states that have a bipartisan commission separate from the legislature. The Idaho Constitution requires the following. Equal populations between districts, geographic contiguity, with districts containing more than one county or portion of a county connected by a state or federal highway, partisan fairness, preserving communities of interest, respecting municipal and county boundaries, and compactness. The Idaho Constitution specifies the commission's timeline to submit a new plan by September 1st. But this year, because the census was late, all dates have been pushed back. This is the tentative schedule from the Legislative Services Office. The plan must be approved within 90 days after the commission first convenes on September 20th. The public will be able to provide testimony and submit district maps between September 20th and December 19th. This year's commission will have to deal with some notable changes in population which have occurred since the last census. 
It's estimated that the census will show Idaho's population will have increased by about 220,000. Idaho analysts predict seven counties increased in population, while the remaining 34 counties decreased. Some districts contain more than one county or portions of a county. Currently, each district has about 45,000 residents, but that will likely increase by several thousand, so district boundaries will change. So how can you get involved to make sure fair maps are drawn? You can share this slideshow with others in your community, such as service organizations, city council members, county commissioners, chambers of commerce, tribal councils, community leaders, and other elected officials. The League website will have notices of upcoming redistricting commission meetings and opportunities for citizen engagement. The public is invited to testify at hearings. People often read a prepared factual statement or tell their personal story, make an important point about a district boundary, and then end with a specific request or recommendation for the commission to consider. Because this process can be daunting if you've never done it before, the League will provide training sessions to help citizens prepare their testimony and practice. Training links will also be on the League website. You may want to include actual sample maps as part of your testimony. Here is a brief introduction to a free mapping tool recommended by the League of Women Voters US. It allows you to experiment with creating your own map. To get started, do a search for Dave's redistricting or more simply DRA 2020. Select Idaho and then select one of the two maps. We'll choose the state legislative map. And we can look at the entire state of Idaho here with the population of 2010. Uh, newer 2020 data will be added eventually with the total population, including minorities, the voting age population and minorities, and the percentage of Democrats and Republicans in the whole state. If we look over here, we'll see all of the 35 districts uh, in Idaho labeled with the population of each one. And they're all right around 43 to 45, 46,000 people in each district. We can click on any district and the color of the district over here matches the color on the map. And it gives us that population information. If we go down here, we see that we've got the map colors showing, but right now I'll take those off and we'll look at the partisan lean. We can see where the Republican population is, uh, where the Democratic population is. We can also look at partisan lean in, by precinct to get more detail. We can also look at the demographic data. These are the populations that are listed here as Hispanic, Black, Asian, etc. We can separate those out or display them all together. If we take away, let's see, we'll put the map colors back on and we'll close that, but we'll bring the overlays up. We can draw more lines. Right now we have just the district lines. If we put put the county lines in there, you'll see that most districts are composed of more than one county. And within those counties are the precincts. So we can see all of them there. If we hover over a precinct anywhere like this, you'll see on the far right, the details about that precinct. And we can move from precinct to precinct. If we have the county labeled up here, then if we go over the county, we'll see the name of the county and its population there. All right, so if we want to change our map in any way, we have to duplicate it first and make a copy that we can play around with. So we're going to ask to open a new map and we're going to take a look at one district in particular and that'll be District 26, which is located here. And as you can remember from earlier slides, it has an unusual shape and we'll have to click on it over here, District 26. And now the data is up here for 26 and the population is about 43,000 in the district. We're going to have to add some more people to that district. Either their population has already increased in the district or if in case it hasn't, we're gonna to have to add some precincts or counties to make up the difference because we need a total of probably between 52 and 50, 
5,000 people in each district for the new redistricting. So if we take our paintbrush and we can add 26, we can add uh, these precincts here, if we want to. Um, we can add whatever precincts we want. And as we're doing that, the population is going up as we can see over here. Um, we can also add counties as well. If we want to go to a, a different county, if we want to add this whole county, we can do that. Um, so we're up to 55,000 right now. So it looks like a shape that may work with a more compact looking shape. Um, and that would be a way we could change it. We can go up here then and look at analytics once we've developed our whole map. And this chart is basically taking into account five different criteria for good uh, redistricting without gerrymandering. The object is to have this shaded area take up as large a space as possible here. The bigger is better for the ratings above. And we can look at individual compactness scores and so on, uh, for instance, to see how well we've done with our map. So that's just an idea of what you can do with Dave's redistricting map. We want to let you know that there will be links to several training videos on the league's website. There will be several ways to contact the commissioners, writing letters and emails, making phone calls, submitting letters to the editor, and sharing actions on social media are additional ways to let your voice be heard. Over the past months, our committee looked at many methods to assess fairness for this presentation. We collected information from a wide variety of sources and were surprised by some of the results we found. We don't know the methods and tools that past reapportionment committees used, but we do realize how difficult it is to ensure that we have a fair map in a state with so many geographic features and limited roadways. We hope you're inspired to become involved in the upcoming redistricting process in order to ensure fair and effective representation in Idaho. In closing, we want to share with you this clever font called Jerry, which was created using the shapes of actual congressional districts that form the alphabet from A to Z. Using this very appropriate font, we want to say, Thank you for your attention today. A link to this recorded presentation is available on the Idaho League's website.